Welcome to Measures of Truth, a His Dark Materials podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. And I'm Anya. And today we're discussing Chapter 10, The Consul and the Bear, Chapter 11, Armor, Chapter 12, The Lost Boy, and Chapter 13, Fencing. In chapter 10, we're still on the boat and everyone is discussing their plans. John Fa thinks that they'll have to get in the good graces of the witches in order to travel across the north. Barter Coram knows a witch who owes him a favor. When the boat lands in Trollisland. Trollisland? Sure. Yep. Sure. Barter Coram and Lyra go and speak to the witches' council who is stationed there. The consul gives them information about a branch of the General Oblation Board working in the town shipping children through, but he doesn't know anything about where they go. He also knows that Lyra has an alethiometer and asks to see her use it. She answers a political question for him, and he then requests that she go out and pick out a particular branch of cloud pine from a group of them, the one that Serafina Pekala, Bartercorum's witch friend, used to fly. Lyra chooses the right branch and then jumps around with it trying to fly, which is exactly what Caitlin would have done. <laughs> uh, and Caitlin writes these summaries in case you couldn't tell. The consul then tells Fartercorum about a prophecy involving Lyra, that she is to save them all from death, but she can't know anything about that. She has to be free to make her own choices and her mistakes. Lyra comes back in and the consul... Consul. I keep on wanting to say consul. <laughs> I also spelled it wrong, like, every single time I wrote it, so... Or spelled it differently every time I wrote it. Lyra comes back inside, and the consul tells them that there's an armored bear in town, and he recommends that they go hire him. Barter Coram and Lyra go talk to John Fa, who agrees that they should hire the bear. After meeting the bear, Iorik Bjornison... After meeting the bear, who's named Yorick Bernison, they find out that the townspeople have hidden his armor somewhere, and finding his armor is the price for hiring him. In chapter 11, we go back to the ship, night falls, and Lyra gets her first look at the aurora. She is moved by it and slips into the state of mind she uses to read the alethiometer, and thinks that maybe whatever force makes the alethiometer work is what makes the aurora also. As she stares at it in that special state of mind, she gets a glimpse of the city on the other side, but she sees something flying across the city and focuses on it, and this snaps her out of that state of mind. The city disappears, but she can clearly see a bird flying towards the ship. A large gray goose lands in front of her a moment later and speaks, requesting to see Farder Corm. Lyra realizes that he must be the demon of Serafina Pecola. Lyra is both fascinated and terrified about seeing a demon alone. Farder Corm and John Fa join them on the deck. During introductions, we learn the goose is named Kaisa and that Lyra is talked about among the witches. Carter Quorum explains that they are here to rescue children taken north and asks for any information on the whereabouts that Kaisa can share. Kaisa tells them he knows where the children are taken and that some witches are working with who they call the dust hunters. He says that dust comes from the sky and that whenever people become aware of it, they are scared of it and will stop at nothing to discover what it is. He says the children are taken to a place called Bolvanger, which means the fields of evil. So I'm sure it's super pleasant. Lyra asks why the witches talk about her, and Kaisa says it is because of her father and his knowledge of the other worlds. And I'm going to read something about that. So to read from the book about what he says here, witches have known of the other worlds for thousands of years. You can see them sometimes in the northern lights. They aren't a part of this universe at all. Even the furthest stars are part of this universe. But the lights show us a different universe entirely. Not further away, but interpenetrating with this one. 
here on this deck, millions of other universes exist, unaware of one another. And he does a little demonstration about these other worlds. John Faw asks if this has anything to do with us. Kaisa doesn't know. Isa says the Oblation Board have locked Azriel up on Svalbard because he intends to use dust to create a bridge to the other world. He also explains that not all witch clans agree on things. Some are working for the Oblation Board and some are working against. Seraphina's clan has so far remained neutral. Also, bears are mercenaries and, they ha- and as they have been paid to keep Lord Azriel prisoner, they will fight to do so. This prompts Lyra to tell John Fa and Farda Korm that she has gotten all the info about York Bernison from the Lithiometer. She knows where his armor is and that the people of the city tricked him and stole it and are treating him like a slave and that they should get it back for him. The next morning, Lyra meets Lee Scoresby, the man with the balloon, and he and his demon Hester distract the Egyptians so Lyra can sneak off and tell York where his armor is. When she reaches York, Lyra is overcome with fear, possibly for the first time in her life and doesn't want to walk up to him. Pan is insistent and turns into a badger to pull as far away from Lyra as he can. This causes them both a lot of pain, and Lyra gives in very quickly and runs to Pan, scoops him up, and thinks she would rather die than face the sadness and pain of separation. She then talks to York and first asks why he doesn't just make new armor from the metal all around him. He says that the metal there is garbage and quickly shreds it with his claws to demonstrate. And that the armor is like his demon, and she might as well replace Pan with a doll. Lyra then tells him where his armor is, but not before making him promise to not take revenge on the townspeople. To just get it and come away with them. York agrees, but says he will kill anyone if they try to get in his way. York gets his armor back with minimal damage to the town, and is promptly forbidden from ever coming back to the town. And is he's just very cut up about it. <laughs> And then the whole group, Lyra, the Egyptians, Lee Scoresby, and York Bernison, head off on their sledges towards Bolvanger. Except for York, who just who he just runs. In chapter 12, during one of their breaks in the travel, John Fa asked Lyra to ask the lithiometer what kind of defenses they should expect at Bolvanger. Lyra asks and reports what it says, but then tells John Fa that the lithiometer is trying to tell her something else, too. There's a village nearby with a kind of ghost in it, and Lyra thinks it's the ghost of one of the stolen kids. John Foss says there isn't anything they can do about it, as the village is too far away. Lyra talks to York, and he agrees to take her there if John Fa agrees, because John Fa is technically the one who's employing him and the only one who can give him orders. Lyra then goes back to John Fa and Farter Corum and convinces them to let her go with York, since he's fast enough to catch back up with the party, even if they travel on. So off they go. And on their way to the village, they see a lot of witches flying across the sky, unsure if they're flying to help or hinder the Egyptians. Once in the village, Lyra and Pan are directed to a shed where the child is. Lyra is very hesitant to go in, and Pan even more so, almost desperately telling Lyra not to go inside. But she does anyway and finds Tony Marcarios. The chapter ends thus. He was clutching a piece of fish to him as Lyra was clutching Pantalaemon, with both hands hard against her heart. But that was all he had, a piece of dried fish, because he had no demon at all. The gobblers had cut it away. That was intercession, and this was a severed child. And then in chapter 13, Lyra and Pan take a moment outside the shed to collect themselves from how horrified they are. After they go back in, they convince Tony to come back with them. Both children clamor up onto York's back, and they head back towards the main party. The whole time, Tony is asking after his demon ratter and if she'll know where he is. Lyra tries to comfort him, but you can tell it doesn't do much. They arrive back to the main party and Lyra explains what the gobblers are doing to the children. All the men recoil back from Tony and York yells at them for being bigger cowards than Lyra. This brings them to their senses and they do what they can to help Tony. Lyra goes to sleep and wakes up the next morning to learn that Tony died in the night. Uh, Lyra goes to his body and gets a cold coin and carves the name of his demon into it and puts it in his mouth the same way that they had found the coins in the skulls in the crypts of Jordan College. Later, Lyra gets the clockwork beetle thingy from Farter Quorum and takes it to Yorick to ask if he could make a special case for it. He does, and afterwards it is hidden within a container that is just the size and shape of the alethiometer. While all this happens, she talks to York about the bears and Svalbard. We learn that York has been exiled for killing another bear because he couldn't control his anger. Lyra asks some leading questions about how to get there, and it is very clear that she is hoping to rescue Lord Asriel. 
During this conversation, York also mentions that Yofer Rachnison is the current king of the bears, and Lyra remembers hearing the scholars talk about him in the retiring room while she was hiding. York also explains that a bear cannot be tricked, and when Lyra points out that the townspeople tricked him, he says he was drinking at the time, so maybe bears can only be tricked when they are acting like humans. Lyra then goes to talk to Lee Scoresby about how his balloon works and gets more info for her secret plan. She also asks Lee about how the Tartars carve holes into skulls and finds out that it is a great honor to have this done. She asks why they would have done it to Grumman before scalping him, uh, but Lee says Grumman had been adopted into the Tartar tribes and they wouldn't have ever scalped one of their own. Lee suspects Grumman isn't dead at all and that Azriel tricked the scholars in order to get money out of them. Grumman being the man whose head we saw in the first, second chapter. Ooh, so you think he just got a random head and said it was Grumman? That is what Lee thinks. Yeah. As I know exactly what happened, I can say nothing. <laughs> yeah, it kind of assumes that he like poked a hole in it if it is a random head. It's a little bit a little bit weird. I think I think both of um Lyra's parents lack a certain as I've discussed with Mrs. Coulter, like a certain area where they know like maybe I've gone too far here. Oh yeah, they're both sociopaths. Yeah. 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 And actually in these chapters, like Lyra behaves in a really moral way, in a way that she hasn't, you know, yet in mm-hmm. the book. She does some really great stuff, like noble things for their own sake but that's not what my favorite thing was because nobility is boring what was your favorite thing ellen (laughs) um i i mostly appreciated like some writing craft here some choices that pullman was making um i really like that we just don't dither anymore about the alethiometer whether it's actually working or not because like in the previous couple chapters you could you know, see the way that Lyra like makes up stories all the time, given very little information and manages to work in facts to make her lies more convincing as like a way to look at the alethiometer and the random things it's pointing at and be like, I totally know what this is saying. But if she was doing that, she wouldn't be able to so consistently get results that in these chapters, it just proves that the alethiometer actually works and so we don't have to worry about that anymore like he's not using that as a tool for suspense instead he's like pushing the plot along quite a bit here which i really like i also what i like about that is how the people around her use it like i feel like there's so many times in stories where something like this is possible but people just don't use it i can't think Mm -hmm. of any specifics off the top of my head but i'm just like that they're like can you tell us you know what the guard situation is like at Bullvanger and what this is like and what this is like. And she's like, yep, just give me a second. Yeah, that's really related to my favorite part too. I love the like specifics of how Pullman writes the alethiometer and the way that he uses the symbols to come up with the meanings. It's like a well-crafted magical system is one of my favorite things. And the way that the alethiometer functions in the story, it's basically that like, you totally believe that uh, it's an actual real language. Mm-hmm. And nobody questions who's who's speaking, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my- well, she, it just proves out to be true, right? So there's like, there's no reason to question it after a while. Are you, from my point of view, there's more of a reason if it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> like, who? what is this consciousness how does it know everything what oh is going i thought you on? meant lyra it'd be like why why can she read it but you, oh I no 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 mean. i meant what, the who's other side. behind it yeah. yes who's answering no, it's a her. machine it's like why does my toaster make toast like that's how they think of it well think. except it it's not a machine except it's not a machine right because it's telling her answers that she didn't even ask questions to mm-hmm. yeah and like that's really different. So it's obviously got its own agenda. Right. Yeah. No, I think Crazy. I think we as readers are supposed to know that, but I think to them it's just like it's just like a truth machine. They're just right. like, "Oh yeah, that thing just tells you answers. That's all it does." There's definitely not an agenda there. No, that that would be crazy. Yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> they should be suspicious. Um, so my favorite bit was everything with Lyra and Tony from when she gets to the shed to when he dies the next morning. I just thought it was so well done how he really wrote how 
disturbed and disgusted everyone was with a mix of pity and everything. It really drives home the horribleness of what's going on. Yeah, and I didn't even notice this until I was like reading out the summaries that you wrote, but um, the whole scene with Lyra and Pan trying to go talk to Yorick earlier is completely like foreshadowing and setting up just how awful yeah. intercision actually is. Um, but it's, you know, subtly enough done that if you're not really like thinking about it, it's just like sitting there in the back of your mind. Yeah, it also just kind of feels like world building because we learn a lot more about demons in these four chapters. Mm -hmm. And so it could just slot into that, but then it comes back right away. Yeah, and, and paying off the gold that. coin thing is like really good yeah. too. Like that's just heartbreaking. Yeah. And it's actually one of the things that I was most upset about in the movie because they don't have Tony die in the movie. Well, it's not even Tony, but they don't have the kid die in the movie. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, let's just remove all the stakes, shall we? Let's just make it not mean anything. <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, speaking of references to earlier stuff, too, bringing Tony back here is another uh, good right. use of a callback, right? Because um, he mm -hmm. was yeah. like a random character who seemed to not truly matter other than the fact that he was contributing to like the general mystery of the Gobblers. And now we like kind of care about him. A little bit more than we would if he was just a random kid. Yeah, that's a good point. Although pull up, uh, pull up. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we should call him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although Philip Pullman did make sure to remind us over and over again how stupid he was, so we shouldn't care that much. Aw. <laughs> Poor Tony. In the movie, they made it Billy Costa, and like that would have been terrible for them to bring Egyptian back to the group of Egyptians. Oh and my God, yeah. Uh... But again, they also removed how terrible it was. So it didn't really it didn't really up the stakes, even though it should have. I think they made it, Billy. Ugh, it's been like a decade since I saw that movie, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Anyways, were there any problematic bits in this chapter? I don't know if there were any new problematic bits, but I did just want to revisit our whole conversation about uh, Egyptians and mm -hmm. are they racist? Because uh, I was talking with someone about it this week, and they pointed out that actually the word uh, gypsy itself, which of course is a slur, is derived from the word Egyptian, which should have been obvious. I mean, they're so similar, but um, apparently when the Roma people first appeared in England in the 16th century, people stupidly and mistakenly thought that they were from Egypt. They were not. And also, um, I was talking to some people who have read the translated versions of these books into other languages, and in those languages, they actually like just use the word for the Roma people. Um, huh. There's no like slight twist or derivation to make it a different word, um, which they... you know again is like doesn't really say anything about Pullman's intentions, but um, that is how like a lot of people are experiencing these texts. Right. I was just going to ask him whether or not they consulted Pullman on that. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's who hard to know. Anyway, yeah. TLDR, pro he probably should have used a different word, but he didn't know, probably. There was a bit when Lee pulls out some cards and starts to talk about how Egyptians are known for cards. I really Ooh, thought yeah. it was going to go bad there, but he didn't really imply that they were known for cheating or anything like that, just that they were known for playing. Mm -hmm. So I was okay with it. I don't know. Could be bad. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Um, I mean, it seemed like they were really studying him intently to make sure that he wasn't cheating. Yeah. Um, but I feel like cheating at cards is like a pretty universal thing. Right, but if he had said Egyptians were known for cheating at cards in the same way that, uh, um, you, but you like you you know you know what I mean? Yeah, like there's a difference. The word between... you're trying not to say, I I know. Yeah, yeah, because he does that as a as a ruse. Like he wants them to pay attention to him, so they'll stop paying attention to Lyra, and she can go off. He's like creating a distraction for her. Yeah, basically, he yeah he knows exactly what he's doing there. Yeah, I think the Egyptians are like really um, portrayed as like very sympathetic, but also kind of the moral center of the book. 
Like in terms of like you look at everything that Lyra does in these chapters and she's basically, you know, last time I talked about like uh, the ego ideal and like trying to be like somebody and Lyra does exactly what John Fa says they're going to do. Like she goes and gets the child no matter what and brings him back. Like that is the Egyptian uh, promise that they make to their own people. And she brings that boy back even when everybody says there's no reason to go or it's too much trouble. Like she overcomes all of these things to kind of for no gain for herself. She's not showing off to anybody like this is a very noble thing that she does. Mm -hmm. And then even after he's dead, she continues to like honor his memory and refuses to allow other people to like, you know, she's mad about the fish getting thrown away and all of that stuff. So like, I think the book is wants you to have a deep sympathy for the Egyptians. And so I don't think that he knowingly was using a slur, but it reminds me of like in Huck Finn, his relationship with Jim and the way that by the end of the book, Huck is willing to go to hell for his friend who to everyone else is just another like runaway slave, another black person who doesn't matter. Like these people don't matter in society, but to Lyra, she wants to be like them mm -hmm. on a certain level. Yeah. And I think it's really important too that they're depicted as not just noble, but also like intelligent, thoughtful people. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause there's like a mm -hmm. whole other history in the literary canon of, um, you know, oppressed people being depicted as like noble and moral, but also kind of like, stupid and uncivilized and unable to take care of themselves which is like absolutely not how the egyptians are depicted yeah they're very capable mm -hmm. yeah but and they're also they're they're shown as very full rounded people because like you also see them mm -hmm. do well, i don't think we see them do any bad things but like john fall was willing to ignore this kid you know to get on with what mm -hmm. they needed or with what they said that they would do and and like just other, you see them make mistakes yeah Exactly. Yeah, but that's good. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. That, that's real good. Shall we move on to science? Everyone's science. favorite bit. Is science everyone's favorite? I don't know. Maybe religion. <laughs> no, religion is boring. I feel like I've been falling down on my whole purpose for being on this podcast because uh, I'm too busy doing actual science to research <laughs> the science <laughs> for this podcast right now. This is, but this this leads to us getting hilarious explanations from me, who doesn't understand what she's saying. <laughs> right. Well, um, thank you, Alan, for pointing out that in this section, Lee Scoresby uses, or I guess he doesn't actually do it, he just talks about it, mixing acid and iron filings together to make gas to power his balloon. Or I guess not power, but like float his balloon. Um, and that is true. If you pour dilute sulfuric acid on iron, you will get iron sulfate and hydrogen gas. I think it's a lot easier just to eat beans, but whatever <laughs> Lee's got to do. <laughs> I'm so I was gonna make a, a joke in the summaries about how Lee talks about making gas. <laughs> that did not even register as I was reading. <laughs> and also, I think I think we should tell our listeners that. Anya's written in the notes here, like, the entire formula for how this would work. And it's <laughs> literal gibberish to me. Oh, really? That's oh, great. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, yeah, that's yeah. so funny, because I've actually used a lot of sulfuric acid in the past. There was, like, a point where all of my clothes just had holes in, in, in them uh, <laughs> from working with acid all the time. And then I guess in these chapters, we get our first like real dive into the multiple worlds theory, which right, is from a demon, from a demon, right. from Kaisa. Kaisa is probably my favorite name in these books. I wonder, see, I feel like all the demon names, maybe except Ratter, have like some kind of like, I'm sure they all mean things that I just don't know what they mean. And it, that kind of stuff always bothers me. I'm like, I should look that up. But well, like, um putting like actual meanings of the words aside philip pullman has said that like the parents demons will name the kids demon so Aww, a that's oh. so cute yeah so a it's hilarious to think of wait, the just, golden monkey wait. and Stelmaria like 
conversing about this. I don't know. That's that's <laughs> hilarious to me. So they named the ratter weird. Well, who who said? Yeah, just ratter. I don't know. That's a ratter. I think he named. Well, remember, his mom wasn't very smart either. Yeah, I was going to so, say it's probably just another probably. Uh, comment on the different classes and the educational system on the different classes, right? Sure. Because yeah. I'm sure Estelle Maria knew that apparently pantalimon means all forgiving or all compassionate. Oh, and pantalimon oh, okay, was the okay, name of a pan, Greek saint. Sure. Oh, okay. This is just oh. a real quick Google. So, like omnibenevolence. Okay. Could be very wrong. I'm trying to remember, do we see, like, demons talking to each other much? Yes. yes. They talk to each other text? more than a demon would talk to a human. That was not their human. Yeah. But they talk to their human the most. Yeah. But, like, in this chapter, we saw Hester and come over and talk to Pan. And it's usually other things like that. Like, okay. when the human is trying, is like, you know what I'm saying, distracting everyone. We've gotten way off topic on the science. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. No, that was me. I brought up Kaisa. Anyways, so multiple worlds means quantum mechanics. The most understandable, easy thing <laughs> in the world. Right. And I'm going to start this off by saying that uh, a famous quantum scientist mechanics man. Yep, that's a sentence I just said. <laughs> named <laughs> Richard Fein- Fe- Fenman? Fenman. Feynman. 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 Uh, yeah. Great. I've never heard it said out loud. Only like read he it. finds you. Oh, great. Um, oh, creepy, given that he was like a known womanizer and predator. Yeah, oh, I, true. Oh, I didn't know that. I wouldn't. Yeah. <sighs> oh, I mean, well. he's like, he wrote some of the best physics texts out there in terms of like teaching hard shit um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at like a good, understandable graduate student level and undergraduate mm-hmm. level. Uh, but also he was a giant dick. Oh, good to know. Good to know. Well, it is very commonly said that he has this very famous quote, but like every time you read the quote, it's different and nobody knows if he actually said it. So, I mean, make up your own mind about that. But anyone who claims to understand quantum theory is either lying or crazy. (laughs) Sounds right. So that's great. And I did want to mention, well, I wanted to specifically talk about the other world, the many worlds theory from the Scrodinger's cat point of view, because cats come up a lot in this series and are probably inspired by that we've only met one cat so far but there's going to be like three more that are kind of important to the plot asriel's i mean it's not a cat that's true yeah yeah yeah. a leopard is totally a cat i don't know what you're talking about i mean if i saw a leopard i wouldn't be like oh it's a cat i'd be like oh shit oh i would absolutely (laughs) be like it's a cat i would be more like oh it's a cute kitty it's a giant cat, but it's still a cat. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I hadn't thought about that. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to attempt to explain the many worlds cat theory, and Anya can rescue me at the end. Ooh. I don't know. We'll see how much rescuing I can do. All right. So I, I I'm leaving out all of the like science that leads up to this experiment. Uh, a theoretical experiment. Nobody actually tried to kill a cat. Let's start with that. No cats were harmed. <laughs> that we're aware of. I can actually picture some junk physicist one time being like, let's get a cat. But anyways, so imagine there's a cat in a room and there's also a radioactive atom. There's also a machine in the room that is monitoring this single atom. And there's no nobody else. The room is completely shut off. If the atom, the the radioactive atom, if it decays, the machine will kill the cat. Um, If it does not decay, it will not harm the cat. So then if you ask what state is the cat in when the atom is at like a 50-50 chance of decaying, according to the rules of quantum mechanics, uh, nothing happens unless it is observed. So the cat is both alive and dead, or neither, until someone looks in and sees of the cat, and then like reality locks into place no one actually but and like that is previous to scrodinger bringing up this theory this was only talked about on the atomic level so they were like like um when what is it is it electrons or whatever that are both waves and particles sure whatever it is that they whatever (laughs) um that they (laughs) 
that when they were monitoring them, there would be both a wave and a particle until somebody like went to check. Mathematically speaking, I don't know however that works. And Scrodinger wanted to say no, because if it's at the atomic level, it doesn't make sense because that means it's at every level. So no one actually thinks a cat can be both dead and alive at the same time. So they came up with this many worlds theory that says instead of nothing being real until it is observed, everything is real until observed. So, mm -hmm. so like in one reality it lives and in one reality it dies. So then in fiction and maybe reality, this means that when something like a choice someone is going to make or an accident or anything is at a perfect 50-50 chance of happening, the world splits and both things happen. Right. And that is my explanation of the many worlds theory. And like this is proved by science that like also or proves is a bad is a not a good word. <laughs> it's a um, yeah. I, I was about to nitpick yeah, about that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, on. sorry. This is come about using the same type of science that like is used every day and makes sense to a lot of people is the best way I can explain that. So from what I've read also, the people who are involved in coming up with this were kind of like, man, I wish we hadn't discovered this because it makes no sense. <laughs> it's the most reliable framework of physics that's been made so far. Quantum theory. Yeah. Here's my question, though. As someone who actually mm -hmm. deals with, like, statistics and probabilistic events, mm -hmm. like, is anything ever truly 50-50 chance of happening? And, like, what's so magical about that anyway? Like, why does the world not split if it's 70-30? I just... That I guess strikes me as mathematically implausible. But if you are a quantum physicist and listening to this podcast and want to tell me why I'm wrong, I mean, that might write be, us a letter. That might be me explaining it poorly. Okay, maybe. Well, the, the thought experiment is binary. I mean, it, it's either alive or dead. Uh, so there, it's going to be one or the other. Yeah. Like if the atom decays or if it doesn't, those are binary states. And so, like, the thought experiment is constructed to... It's supposed to be like a reductio that that is is like shows that quantum theory can't be true because it's stupid. Like that's the point of this Schrodinger's cat thing is to like. But it actually, what it does is really nicely illustrate how like quantum states and probability and stuff like that, uh, like that is the fundamental like fabric of the universe. I think the pro like probability stuff like 70 30 i think i think it's still like there's seven universes and three universes 70 and 30 or whatever whatever the like it still splits every single possibility like that's the idea of it <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if there if it's 50 50 then you just get two universes or what you know 50 or 50 universe whatever yeah I guess at the end there, I, instead of saying when anything's at a 50-50 chance, I should have said when everything when anything is at like an even chance of happening. Not or not even even, but just like whenever anything is any chance. Any chance. Yeah. Well, I I am not sure if the any chance thing is reflected in the science part of the you know what I'm saying? It might have to be even, but it doesn't necessarily have to be binary. I don't know. So there, I am not a scientist, there... I don't know why I'm talking. <laughs> I'm not a physicist, but I did bang one once, so <laughs> I don't know what insight that gives me here. <laughs> Do you want me to cut that out? or I mean, I guess it means that there's a world. It's pretty funny. I would leave that in. So there's a world where you didn't bang them also. There is a world where I did not bang that physicist. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that a happier world or a sadder one? No, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> This, <laughs> so this story was like written in the 90s too and like string theory was real hot shit at that time because uh, it was like pretty new uh, and string theory like implies that there are other universes because it like basically the idea is is that there's kind of other sets of physics that are like rolled up into very small kind of bubbles of universes that exist like sideways to ours and so there are other possible like everything could have shaken out in very very different ways and those exist simultaneous to our universe and they don't really interact with each other but they're out there um and we can mathematically perceive them through string theory uh so there's like a 
solid implication that there are other universes that are very different from ours. I don't know if that's what he was thinking, because like this is pretty popular in science fiction and fantasy, right? This idea of like alternate worlds. Well, I think that's why the scientists were so like upset when they then kind of proved it. Well, again, not proved, but, you know, came up with a theory that supports it because Mm -hmm. they were like, this is science fiction. (laughs) Yeah, I think Einstein said something like God doesn't play dice with reality Mm -hmm. or something like that. I've honestly, there's so much about like the weirder side of quantum mechanics and quantum theory that like works with religious theories that I've never understood why churches don't just get on that and be like, look, the science and, and I don't know, whatever. But they're so set on denying so much of science, even though a lot of science could probably help them out. Oh, let me introduce you to Deepak Chopra. He's uh, you'd love it. I have shelved a lot of his books. <laughs> I used to work at a bookstore, so a lot of my knowledge of people is like how annoying they were to shelf. <laughs> right. Well, that guy's very into using like science that is not well understood and then like laying religious ideas on top of it and but, going like But in this like a smart it. way or in like a that in means like a this... sells a lot of books way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, Kate, how about I promise to between now and the end of the book when all of this multiverse stuff comes more concretely into play, I will try and look up the multiverse and see. I will ask uh, my physicist friends who I may or may not have banged. Um, <laughs> In multiple worlds. Ex- so like you did it and you didn't do it and you both didn't and didn't do. Oh my God. Anyway. Yeah. I'll ask them if they can help explain multiverse theory to me. Wonderful. I mean, I get it insofar as it, like I need to, but I would actually be interested in learning more. Yeah, or like hearing how much like most practicing physicists actually like believe or care about oh, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That would be good to know, like how widely accepted it is in this day and age. Mhm. I feel like it's misunderstood like from what I've seen about it, like the way that <clears throat> the way that we're talking about it like you made a choice to, am I going to buy the red car or the black car? And like, that doesn't seem to be how it shakes out in the math. It's it's more like, did this, you know, did this electron go to this atom or that atom? And so you would like, maybe you've been to other universes and you don't even know it because the only difference between this universe and that universe is the orientation of some like tiny particles on Jupiter or something like that. I agree with you in theory, but I always thought that the point of what Scrodinger was saying was that if we even if we think it makes sense on an atomic level, here is a theory showing you how it would affect the world at a right. bigger level and how it would just have mm. unending implications that that super don't make sense. So I, I I don't know. Because like thinking about an atom on Jupiter creating, you know, a world where it did decay and it didn't decay, who cares? That changes nothing. Right. But thinking about a cat that is alive and or a cat that is dead, that is a huge difference. No, and I get it, because everything's made of atoms, and if this kind of probability froth can happen, it should build up in ways that are, like, bizarre. And I guess, insofar as the book is concerned, it sets up the idea that there are an unending number of universes, of of, um, alternate worlds that you can go to. And that's that's really what it's saying, and I guess it's the only important part, insofar as the book is concerned. From, like, the even bigger grander perspective if there is like truly infinite worlds since the time that the universe began like probably like in most universes um you know like do human beings even exist have we evolved i mean right. check back with us in book three okay <laughs> <laughs> we will explore think, that question i think that's the last thing that stephen hawking wrote about too before he passed away was like the idea that there are in in terms of like there's an infinite number of possible universes he said actually no there's not there's like it's a pretty limited set and in terms of like like you said like who cares about an atom on jupiter mm-hmm. he was like in terms of like universes that we would care about it's a very limited set yeah and he kind of like laid out what you know the probability of that is not that i understand it at the very least in most universes, you probably do not exist based on like the right. random chance of ancestry. 
Okay, so let's move on from quantum physics because I feel like we could be here forever. And I'm going to give my layman's definition of how the Northern Lights works. And then Anya's going to come in and, and save me. Because I've also <laughs> banged an astronomer. <laughs> so No, just kidding. So, solar wind blowing past the magnetic field, which is thinner, for lack of a better term, at the poles, bumps into the atoms in our atmosphere and kind of like exchange electrons and then making some of these atoms charged and that makes them glow, much like um, uh, how neon lights work. That's that's my very simple explanation. And, and like the different gases glow different colors, so that's why we get different colors. I think that sounds good. As really? far as I can tell. Oh, well, she just... <laughs> Again, I promise to do my homework better next time. Okay. Right. If, I, if there's a better way to explain it, I will do it on a future episode. I mean, it's not the last time we're going to see them. Yeah. Uh, have any of us ever seen the Northern Lights? I, I have not. And you're Canadian, I feel like. If any yeah. of us was going to. If I any of us like were going to. I like 10 minutes from the border, though. Like, I don't... <laughs> Just recently, there was, uh, I didn't get up for it, but I actually think it was raining, but the Northern Lights were down here where I live um, just last week or so. Whoa. Uh, Yeah, because there was like an especially strong solar storm, and uh, it was just like, it was kind of perfect conditions. I remember reading, like, it's going to happen, like, go outside from where you are at like 3.30 in the morning, and I was like, oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> no, nope, I don't. I don't care enough about that to do that. So no, I'm not going to. There have been times I when it's been it's like reached where I live technically, but I live in the middle of a city, so the light pollution didn't let us see it. Mm. I will say, very st- stereotypically, I am the only person in my family who has never seen them. <laughs> so it's it, I've just like failed as a Canadian. I've never been That's north funny. in the winter. So, or I, do you see them in the summer? I think of them as winter things, but maybe that's just because of these I mean, books. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, they exist in the summer. It's just that you can't see them because in the summer, it's not dark for very long. That's true. Right. So, like, if it never gets dark enough, you just won't see them, is my guess. Right. But an mm. educated guess. See, this is just good pedagogy. We're, like, priming people. By posing questions <laughs> and giving half baked answers, and then we'll give them the real answers later after they've had time to stew on them. Right, of course. Probably get a lot of feedback. Now that we've had as much science as we usually do religion, let's move on to religion. <laughs> uh, so we got some witches this time around. Have they mentioned the witches before? I think they have uh, brought them up a little I bit. Don't- I don't remember when, though, except maybe in the retiring room. Maybe she overheard something about witches. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just remembering our episode zero where we talked about the movie that doesn't exist. Right. uh, And worried about witches on brooms in the show. But I did want to talk a little bit about witches because this is like a weird uh, religious situation. Uh that you know like everybody's heard of witches what does that even mean because like being a witch is not like a religious choice it's like a label that was slapped on people uh who stepped outside of christianity uh it was usually used against women to help keep them in line in terms of the institution of christianity in europe Um, And so overall, like to call people witches, I think signals in the story that like these are people who are outside of this other society, this Christian magisterium. Uh, And that's like the main thing that the word implies in the story, because we have all of this information from like our world that witches stand outside of Christianity, basically. I mean, and they have has. Sorry, Mm -hmm. just to jump in here. It also has, like, fantasy writing implications because they do 
in some way or another fulfill some of the tropes. You know, they fly on branches instead of brooms. That's the only thing that's occurring to me off the top of my head, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah. No, totally. And they have supernatural abilities. Um, and we see that in the story expressed here. Usually they would have like an animal familiar. And we talked about shamanism before. Um, but everybody has an animal familiar in this world. So that wouldn't be a big deal. The thing that's a big deal here is that the familiar is like a very long way from uh, its master in this case. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's like well, extraordinary. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would never call a demon and its person like a master situation. That's I, I guess just in terms of like the typical witch relationship to like its cat or its, uh, you know, whatever. Right. Just yeah. for demons, I wouldn't Familiar. say that. I think at right, some point right, they right. say like seeing a demon without its body. Yes. Because it's the it's the soul. Right. And we're going to get to that. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Descartes and uh, some theology, too. Yeah, but witches, right? They're inherently evil, usually, because they stand outside of that Christian system. It's weird. Uh, like when Pullman wrote this in the 90s, just like string theory and quantum theory, witches were kind of like a thing in culture that was ascending in the consciousness. It, there was like some neo paganism going on, uh, some, the rise of like Wicca and stuff like that. So we're all fans of Buffy. We know about like. Tara and uh, Willow. <laughs> Willow, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, like, that was a popular thing in the 90s. And the reason for that was because there was like this um, confluence of like feminism and a rejection of kind of patriarchal Christianity and wanting to kind of reclaim a cultural space that was centered around the experience of women. And a lot of that like gets funneled into uh, Western new age religions and uh, Wicca and stuff like that. But all of it is like a little bit unfocused in terms of like a religious tradition. There's not like a particular God or goddess. It's, you know, you just pray to like, if you pray at all, you pray to the goddess um, or you're praying to like, or you're, you're appealing to not particular things. You're like to the earth and the air and stuff like that. Um, Can I uh, because, jump in here a bit? Like, yeah. Sorry. I just, I will say, I think I, every girl I've ever known, at least well enough to know these types of things has had a witch phase. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 and I don't mean that to belittle, that to belittle people who actually practice Wicca. Some people had it as a phase and some people stuck with it. I don't know. Obviously, this isn't true for every girl ever. It's just the ones that I've known. But I would say praying within Wicca, at least, is kind of replaced with the idea of spells, which is just kind of a word they use. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean spells like, like Harry Potter spells. It's about connecting and uh, putting your intention out into the world and that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I would also say people who practice it probably think of it less of a religion and more of a form of spiritualism. Because it isn't very organized. Well, but that that's I think that's that, debatable. I think it gets into euphemism, and a lot of times when we talk about like, uh, I think organized religion is bad, or uh, I'm not religious. Those are euphemisms for I think Christianity is bad, and I'm not a Christian because like to Western people, the influence of Christianity is like so ubiquitous that there's a tight association between religion and Christianity. Not that other religions don't exist. That's not what I mean when I say that. But right. like the use of euphemism in that case to say like, oh, it's not a religion um, kind of like erodes the possibility of other actual religions than Christianity. Because, because people don't want to be impolite or get called out by saying like, it's not like Christianity or I, I don't like Christianity. They say, like, I don't like religion. And then I think that causes a problem when you do that, because it like, like I said, like it degrades the possibility that somebody could be Jewish or Islamic or Sikh or whatever, because it's like it's almost like those religions don't exist. If you say I don't like religion or it's not religious or when you actually mean it's not Christian. That's a fair not point. that you were doing that. It's it's just like the most common thing you hear when you talk about religion. I will jump in and say, I definitely agree with what you just said, and I'd never thought of it that way before. Oh, yeah, a lot of people don't. 
Yeah, so that's good to have pointed out. But I also think that that particular euphemism comes about because in our culture, at least, for the most part, the Christians are the people in power. And it's, I'm not, I'm not saying we should stick with this euphemism, I'm not defending it, I'm saying this is why I think it's come about. So it's absolutely cool, kind of, to say, yeah, we don't like them. Well, it's very much not cool to say we don't like Jewish people or we don't like the Jewish religion. Yeah, I think that's, um, and I'll, I'll probably talk about this more on another episode, that's kind of a postmodern thing about who has power and who doesn't. And yeah. Are you punching down or are you punching up? And yeah, so to say things like, I, I think that all religions are not good uh, and that, but then to specifically say something like that's tiny and say like Zoroastrianism is bad. It'd be like, why are you picking on them? <laughs> like, yeah. What are you doing? I guess yeah. for me personally, I don't, religion isn't for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And that I guess is a completely different thing than saying I don't like religion. It's uh, yeah. It's such a deep part of our culture that like, I think things about religion are invisible to people like that's why i've been talking about teleology so much mm -hmm. and like the chosen one and all that stuff because i feel like these are ideas that are encoded into fantasy and i think a lot of people assume that like luke skywalker being the chosen one is like a story thing or a joseph campbell thing and it's like a very very religious thing in reality um and so the way that we have set up our society or like our morals to think that like the best thing you can do is to sacrifice yourself for your friends. That's like the most noble act you can do. Well, that's like a religious idea that comes straight from Jesus. That's like other societies didn't think that way. They thought you were a chump if you did that. And like the best thing you could do would be to get in there and kill as many people as possible and then run away to live another day. That would be the smart thing to do. Right. Or the noble thing to do. But we think that because of religion. But that's not how... A lot of people see it anymore. So part of the reason why I talk about this stuff is to try and like illustrate how even if you aren't religious, a lot of your ideas are probably religious. You just aren't aware of it. Which is like kind of the point of the world, right? Is it's even more emphasizing that, right? That like the Christianity and religion has just seeped into every aspect of their lives. Yeah, that's the world building that Pullman has constructed has like Christianity is like this inescapable empire, but they don't even think of it that way, right? It just like affects their thinking on every level. So, yeah, I don't I don't think I have anything else to say about witches, but it's cool that they show up and that's a little bit of history about them. Anyway, um so yeah, like you were saying the world is uh full of Christianity and all these Christian ideas on you. We're going to talk a little bit more about Calvin, who, you know, was the last Pope ever. Um, but in our world was like this very important uh, Protestant guy. <laughs> well known. That's his label, right? Well known Protestant guy, John Calvin. So in a, an important thing uh, to know about Calvin, we talked about predestination a little bit and, um, I think in these chapters, like we get a little bit more about the idea of souls and all of that kind of stuff. So I wanted to lay out like what was going on with Calvin and how it relates to the book. So like to understand that real, real quick, we've talked about teleology and uh, how things are made to be used certain ways. The idea of like the old Catholic church was that the earth was made. It's teleological purpose for from God was to uh, be the perfect place for people to live, for human beings to live. And like everything in the world is calibrated to be used by human beings to like have the best life. Like the animals are delicious. The vegetables are nutritious. Uh, the ground is great to um, build stuff on. And the sea is full of fish and is awesome to surf on and stuff like that. Right. Um, so like all of this is here for us, it's made for us, but the earth does not get perfectly used because people made the choice to sin and do bad things. And because we did that, we're not using, we're not living our lives to their like maximized teleological potential. And so it throws everything off kilter. 
And that's why there's like earthquakes and floods and droughts and all of that kind of stuff, because we're not using the earth correctly. We're not using ourselves correctly and everything gets more and more away from God's plan. So that's like Catholic doctrine. Jesus comes back to fix all this. Like that's the reason that Jesus comes to earth. He maximizes his teleology by sacrificing himself to forgive everyone's sins. And then this will gives us a way to like try and get the earth back on track um, to be a perfect place again. Calvin says all that's wrong. It's just totally incorrect. Okay. And the reason that all of it's wrong, huh? Sorry. I thought that Calvin was the dude who was all about teleology. Oh yeah, he is. Okay. He says that the teleological purpose of the earth and people and uh, animals and the ocean and everything in the universe is to glorify God. That's Uh. the reason that everything exists. It's not because... So Catholicism is centered on humanity. Calvinism is centered on God. Gotcha. Predestination, his whole thing about predestination and not having a choice. Like we're talking about multiverse here. Mm -hmm. To Calvin, he says, okay, uh, basically the the way that the Reformation laid out salvation was to say, if you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, then you will go to heaven for eternity. If you don't ask Jesus to forgive you, you will go to hell for eternity. Well, who's really making the choice there? Is it God or is it you? Who's in control? You're basically like using God like a light switch. You're turning on heaven or you're turning off heaven. If you can kind of see what I'm saying there. Yeah. So to Calvin, that's not an all powerful God. That's like some kind of machine or something. God already knew what you were going to do before he created the universe because he knows everything. He knows every choice that you're going to make, according to Calvin, because there's only one set of possibilities that exist. And those are the possibilities that God knows about. And that's why in the world that Pullman creates, it is heresy to talk about other worlds, other possibilities. Okay. I totally get this now. And it like, because it's all set up in opposition to multiverse theory. Yes. There's only one possible universe and it's the one that is in God's mind. And we are going through the motions of that universe, not for our own teleological benefit, but for the glorification of God. Uh, Like he made everything to kind of reflect his own radiant excellence, basically. And you had... That just sounds so boring and like, I don't know. Sorry. You would be the very first person to say that Calvinism is boring. (laughs) No, I don't think she's saying that Calvinism is boring. I think he's she's saying his view of the world, like if the world actually existed just as having already been known by God, that's boring. Yeah, I think if you would want like the the good pitch on this, um, not that like anybody was thinking of it in a cynical way, the kind of like the postmodern way that we're talking about it in in terms of like advertising or something like that. But I think the way that Calvin saw it was that the Catholic Church told you constantly that everything that you did was um, like every sin that you committed was hurting Jesus on the cross, like every time that you did it, Um, and that every bad choice you made was like making the world a worse place. And um, and so like that's like chaotic and that's like people are like too powerful in, in that equation. And he said, no. You, as a Christian, were chosen by God before the foundations of the universe, and he has everything under control. Things are not spinning into some kind of chaotic who knows what. Like, it's all part of the plan. It's all on track. And I think to a lot of people that was really comforting, especially during the time in the Reformation where there's like, people are like killing each other over, are you a Lutheran or are you a Catholic? And things are very chaotic. And so the idea that like, no, no, God knows exactly what's going to happen and everything's going to be okay was like pretty appealing. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. So speaking of- Can I ask of, a question? Yeah, sure. What is Calvin's thoughts on free will? 
Laughter. Okay. It's complicated. Uh, he does not believe that you have the ability to choose to um, seek repentance. You, you can't like repent of your sins and, and be let into heaven. That's something that God foreordained. You have to go through the motions of it, but it's not something that you chose. God already knew that you were going to do that. However, if you choose to sin, that is you making a choice. Ah. And uh, choosing to do the wrong thing is your choice and will send you to hell, which is your responsibility and not God's responsibility. So there's like this weird kind of shuddering of uh, like only God lets people into heaven, but humans send themselves to hell. Uh, that sounds a little hypocritical to me, but carry on. It's very dark. Like Calvinism is heavy. Which makes it good for like this weird world that Pullman is making. Right. So there's other Puritans. Um, there's others. There's other Protestants besides uh, Lutherans and Calvinists. For example, the Puritans mm -hmm. uh, in England. These were people who, um, you know, up in England during the Protestant Reformation, the king wanted to get a divorce. The Pope said, uh, nope. And then the king said, uh, you can't fire me. I quit. <laughs> uh, and started his own church right. where that he was the head of. And after a while, these Christian Puritans pop up. They say, this church isn't hardcore enough for us. They like to dance and have fun, and really that's not what we're all about. And so they stage a coup and get rid of the monarchy. Uh, there's like a big civil war, which I feel like is not taught in North America at all. Is that, that the War of the Roses? Uh, no. No. That's like a whole other thing. Okay. Strangely, I think. I think I learned about this in college when I studied, studied theater history, because depending on who was in power <laughs> was whether or not theaters were open or not. Yes, that's right. No, you're, you're totally right yeah. about that. It's also the reason that America gets founded, um, because the monarchists come back and the, the Puritans are like, oh, we got to get out of here. And they go to Plymouth Rock. So among the Puritans during the time where the king was not a king, and there was no king in England. There was like a parliament kind of thing. Well, there's a dictator um, and then a, a parliament. Anyway, the important thing here is that one of the Puritans was John Milton, who wrote the poem that inspired the name of the series in this book, right. uh, Paradise Lost. He was a Calvinist. The poem is very Calvinist. It's a retelling of Adam and Eve and uh, like all the stuff that happens with Satan. Like by the end of the poem, what you realize is that everything that Satan has done, like God knew he was going to do all that stuff. And he knew that Adam and Eve were going to do the things that they were going to do. And all of this was part of God's plan. Like he knew from the beginning mm -hmm. that it was all going to shake out this way. That's the point of the poem. Like when you get to the end of it is, is that God is in control of it. And it's not, we didn't uh, lose paradise because we messed up our teleological potential. We lost paradise because we were always going to lose paradise. But we choose the sin. I don't, oh, that bothers me. Okay, carry on. It should bother you. There's, there's a lot of, there are books of like hundreds of pages that deal with that theology double predestination blah 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 it's has little to do with this book right basically it just comes down to more determinism it's so like in the milton poem we talked about like his dark materials mm -hmm. like that's not in the bible like when god makes the universe he makes it ex nihilo he makes it like from nothing there is nothing and then god makes the universe the reason that milton puts the dark materials in the story is because it's chaotic and God masters the chaos because it's showing like it's symbolic of the Catholic disorder that like the ideas of their theology are disordered and centered on humans uh, when they should be centered on God. So like that tells you their view of the soul, basically, right. that your existence is like 
you're like kind of a, like a robot of fate or something. Like you feel like you have free will. You feel like you're aware of yourself, but really you're going through the motions of what God already knows you're going to do. You don't really have choices, which brings me around to philosophical zombies and <laughs> Rene Descartes. <laughs> All right. So in these chapters, we get uh, Tony Macarius, who is severed from his soul. And like, what does that mean to have no soul? Well, there was this guy named Rene Descartes who thought very deeply about the how do we know anything? How do we know that we exist? Uh, seems like a question you don't need to ask, but he thought it was pretty important. And it turns out to be like a bedrock principle of rationalism, right? This is the guy who said, I think, therefore I am. So probably people have heard of that, right? Um, the basic idea there is that you can uh, like look at a picture and misunderstand it. So the most famous one is like uh, a picture of a vase, but then you kind of shift the way that you're looking at it. And it looks like two people kind of looking at each other in profile. Their noses are almost touching. Right. But then when you see it like that, you can't see the vase anymore. And then you switch back and now you can see the vase, but you can't see the faces. And so your eyes are kind of like playing tricks on you, right? They're not reliable. Um, people who have amputated limbs say that they can still feel the amputated limb, even though it's gone. Uh, so you can't trust your sense of touch. You're like all of your senses are kind of unreliable. The, the world could be a simulation or a dream. You don't know. You can't prove what's real because it's just information from your senses, which are imperfect uh, and not doing uh, a perfectly objective job of representing what's going on around you. The only thing you can prove is that you're thinking about it, that you can prove to yourself that you can think because you can kind of mentally observe yourself thinking. You're self-aware, and that's really the only thing that you can prove about your own existence, according to Descartes. Right. And to him, this means that your body is not necessary for you to exist, because it could be a simulation. You could just be like some kind of consciousness in like a dream or like in a bottle or something like a brain in a jar or something like that. The Matrix. The Matrix, exactly. So like that's scary. Right. But basically, like he feel he feels like this proves that we're made of two things. We have that what we really are is a mind. And then we also have a body that that mind uses to like get around and do stuff. But we are not essentially our bodies. We are essentially minds. Um, and the body is like unnecessary. Right. OK. So this is like you, you can kind of like understand how all that works and of course like philosophers have argued about this ever since then is this correct or not correct there's all kinds of proofs against it but one of the ones um that is kind of funny is where you turn this whole thing inside out and so you say like instead of the simulation being on the outside what if it's on the inside <clears throat> so what if you had a body that otherwise seems to be like a normal person but actually on the inside, there's nothing going on in there. Like they, you talk to them, you can have a conversation and everything, but actually they're not aware of themselves in the way that you're aware of your own existence. They have no ability to doubt. I work with people like this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we all know yeah. people who sound like philosophical zombies, which is what these people are called. If we don't need a body to exist, then this is the idea of like, does a body need a mind to exist? Um, and, the, you know, and it's it's supposed to prove that like that the idea of that is absurd and therefore it should like prove that um, Descartes idea is absurd in the same way that like Schrodinger's cat yeah. is supposed to prove that that whole idea is dumb. But actually, like it kind of illustrates like you can imagine it, right? Or, or if you've played a video game and you talk to like an NPC for a while, you realize that like, oh, your story was so tragic and moving, but now you're just repeating it over and over. And I don't believe <laughs> that you're real anymore. It's like that. Yeah. And so we've actually experienced these things. They're, they're kind of real. And in this case, Tony Macarius is kind of this thing. Like he's, he doesn't come off as a whole person in in the chapter i mean he's in shock certainly but like there's also something wrong 
the way that he's behaving. He's not like a normal person anymore. Like it's not just trauma. It's something more than trauma. Yeah. He seems disassociated from reality. He he can't he can't cope with it. and he's also like getting weaker and weaker and and his body like dies in the absence of his soul. Well, I don't think they ever really go into it in the book, but his body dies I suspect he dies of exposure. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he just didn't try to keep warm because he didn't care. Was didn't, no like, one take, actually, was no one in the camp taking care of him? Well, they talk about how he just wouldn't settle down, like they couldn't keep him in one place. Uh, so okay, I, I yeah. you know, like he just kept going, and he didn't necessarily have the best outdoor gear on and all those sorts of things. So I, I just wanted to specify that he didn't die from his lack of a demon. It was his. Well, not like specifically, but his lack of a demon did cause his death, but in other ways, you know. Indirectly. So. Yes. I mean, necessarily, again, we actually don't know. It just, it doesn't say the book. It just says he was dead. They couldn't get him to settle until suddenly he lied down dead. And that was the first time he looked peaceful. And we definitely do know that if you kill the human body that the, because um, we saw this in in the last time when the uh, Egyptians killed uh, the guys who were trying to kidnap Lyra, yes. their demons just kind of Poofed. discorporate. They just vanish. I like kind of. poof. Okay, but what about the converse? Like, if you try to kill, if you just don't separate a demon from their human, but you just kill a demon, does the human then also die? Uh, that's also talked about in these chapters, actually, when Farter Quorum uh, talks about how he met Serafina Pecola. He saves her from a big red bird that's, like, attacking her, and he, he shoots oh, yeah. it. Or, I think... And then later on, when he learns that witches' demons can go far away from them, he realizes that he shot a demon, and mm-hmm. and it, it fills him with horror. And if he'd known, or he he suspects, he I'm, I'm sure he's right that he he must have probably killed the witch because I'm sure that if you kill a demon, you're you're killing the person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's like I don't know. Like to me, Tony's story, like I was like, oh, he's a philosophical zombie, and we haven't talked about Descartes yet, which. We probably should have since he was the guy who was like, your mind is not your, uh, you are not, you you are your mind, you are not your body kind of a kind of guy. Uh, It's funny, though, because Descartes says that, like, you can't, um, like, you can chop up your body, but you can't chop up your mind. And that kind of proves that the mind and body are not the same thing. But like later on, we talked about Freud and Jung, they definitely chop up the mind. Because there's like conscious and unconscious, uh, or like id and ego and super ego I don't and stuff know about like that. Because that. that's kind of similar. That's like labeling your mind, not necessarily chopping mm-hmm. it up. That's like saying you have arms and legs, or not chopping your arms and legs off. Yeah, maybe they're the organs of the body of of the mind, yeah. rather. Uh, like you're saying, I think I think Descartes would, especially with the unconscious, he would be like, no, this can't be. Like he would not like the idea of the unconscious and i feel like that's what the demons are in pullman's world um they're kind of like your unconscious uncontrollable self your other the other part of you that is not like front of mind i don't know we're talking about them in terms of your mind when really at least so far they've only really been talked about in terms of your soul Mm -hmm. which i guess you could argue is the same thing but in the book it's very much said that they're your soul and there is a bit later where this is discussed more. I think Descartes felt like there was not much difference between the mind and soul. He kind of saw this as a proof because he was a Christian. He saw this as kind of a proof that the soul does exist, which implies that the soul has a maker, which is kind of like an indirect proof that God exists. So I think therefore I am, therefore God made me, therefore God exists. Kind of, that would be like the ontology of that. And so... You know, when you when you compare that to like Calvin and Milton and and all of this like determinism stuff, like the reason that souls exist there is to is only for the, like the glorification of the person who created them. And whereas your soul or your mind like exists for you in, in Descartes world. Right. And, and like that, like gives us like the modern like Descartes kind of kicks off all of the modern philosophical and science thinking that happens in Europe, the rationalism and stuff. Okay. It also kind of like fucked up a lot of medicine that was like built on mind body being separate in ways that we know is absolutely not true. Mm-hmm. 
I suppose, not to belittle what you just said, very true. Y- your physicalness can affect your mind. Um, but I guess in insofar as the books, I'm going to spoil something that happens later. It's not really plot related, or at least it isn't the way that I'm going to talk about it. But there's a bit where Lyra sort of sits down and thinks about it. And she's like, there's the physical me, there's Pan, who's my soul, and then there's the bit inside me that does the thinking. And so at that point, the book takes a very like three-part thinking of who and what a human being is, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very Cartesian construction because she she could even think that like Pan could be like some kind of simulation or something or some kind of hallucination or dream or something like that. And so the bit inside of her that thinks is that kind of, I think, therefore I am irreducible self that Descartes talks about. There's a lot of, you know, like I'm not saying that like there's a lot of people who don't agree with Descartes and there's a lot of like proofs against it and a lot of so like to lay this out here like I'm it's just I think it's related to the story. Gotcha. I'm not like Yeah, no, the philosophical zombie is interesting. I spe- yeah. and I think we will have some more on that later also. Uh I was just sort of saying that I don't think I think Pullman was going in a different direction. Mhm. Then I think he was going in a different direction than Descartes was or it is or whatever. And there's a lot of theories of mind. Like if, yeah, if we continue with the, with the other books, it'd be, I, I want to, uh, because I think there's a lot of other philosophers and philosophies of mind that all of that stuff gets into. It's real interesting. Mm-hmm. Yes. I also hope we do. I just gave a thumbs up. <laughs> then I realized you couldn't see me. So was there anything else we wanted to discuss that did not fit into our above categories or any of the tangents that we took therein. I think there's lots of cool demon stuff that happens in this section, so maybe yes. that would be a good place to start. We learn, we do learn so much about demons in these chapters. It is, it's like, it's so much, it's small bits that I'm just like, why aren't people talking about this? I need more information for, <laughs> you know, like, I think this is the... When Lyra is talking with the sailor on the boat, I think is the first time that we really learn that demons do settle into a particular shape and stop shifting and that it happens like it's sort of a part of growing up. Adults have settled demons and children don't. Children, you know, try out different shapes and try to see who they are and that when a demon settles, it can sort of reflect a part of who you are and in some ways help you come to terms with that. Or like just the opposite. Have you be, have you see this part of who you are and reject it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this strong sense of identity. That one with the story about the sailor with the dolphin Mm -hmm. is like so sad, uh, but interesting. Because like how much control do you have over this? You know, to, to, we just talked about Calvin and like, you don't have choices like, was it always going to be a dolphin or if he had never been by the sea, would it have still turned into a dolphin? Like do the animal shapes actually mean things in the same way that the symbols on the alethiometer mean things? Or mm-hmm. is that just a meaning that has been pressed onto them by society? And do those social meanings influence the shape that your demon takes? Like all, all these, like it's interesting. Well, I think it's- he would have been a different person if he hadn't grown up by the sea. Mm -hmm. So his demon would have necessarily had to have been different. That suggests that that there's like some level of like self-regard and control to the whole thing. And it's not destiny the way that the society thinks that it is destiny. Oh, you have a dog. Well, therefore you are a servant. Oh, you have a wolf. Therefore you are a soldier. Well, I think that we can agree on because like as much the world that we've seen is, is messed up. Like, yeah. Within, within the story. I mean, I agree with you, Anya. It's just interesting that that is the case. I honestly yeah. I think that can be boiled down to nature versus nurture. Mm. Mm-hmm. In a way, like if he, like you said, if he'd grown up in a completely different environment, he'd be a completely different person. Yeah, I, which is basically where I come down on that. I think, you know, we're so shaped by our social environments. And so... The form that your demon takes should also be shaped by that social environment. I mean, it's not coincidence that the people who are servants all end up with dog demons, right? Yeah, no. Although we do see a servant in these chapters who has a chicken. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Well, that person's clearly a coward. Oh. Like a... Chickens are not cowards. Chickens are vicious (laughs) little beasts. That's true. 
Speaking of which, geese. We do see a goose demon. And, you know, he's. I loved this. He's not, obviously, not a Canada goose because he would have just killed them all as soon as he landed. He was a Canada goose. <laughs> he would have landed and been like, this is your boat, but it's my territory now. Get off. <laughs> You've not grown up around a lot of Canada geese. You might have different feelings about them, but uh Oh no, they're bastards. Yeah, they're bastards. Yeah. No, this reminded me of one of my favorite things about podcasting with Anya. We had to at one point uh come up with a good name for a lot of Jesuses. Okay. <laughs> because of our other podcast about American gods. Uh where there was an episode with a party where there was like a hundred Jesuses there. And we were like, What are we gonna call this? And I was like, A choir of Jesuses? What did you call it? Oh, I don't even remember. Oh, you called it a gaggle of Jesuses. And I I have always loved that. I think that's like perfect. And this reminded me of that. So <laughs> Because Jesuses are also very aggressive. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, okay. Well, there's... I have never met a goose that is not a Canada goose. The other geese might be very nice. It's just the Canada goose that is a bitch. There's just an old saying about like um about like chasing like a wild like a wild goose chase. Oh, uh, um, yes. And and that is actually a euphemism for like seeking God or seeking the divine. And so to call it a gaggle of Jesuses is like delightful. I also feel compelled to point out that Canadian geese should actually be called like American geese in the same way that European storks should actually be called African storks because they spend most of their fucking time in Africa. <laughs> They're only in Europe for the summer. Anyway. I mean, I agree with you to an extent, but God, they're fucking everywhere here. I don't know. Aren't they born there? Uh, I mean, so they're citizens. That's how that works. No, I mean, oh, okay. I was actually going to bring up that they would be America geese because they're not Canadian geese as they are not citizens. They're, <laughs> it's a Canada goose. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> Is it really Canada goose, not Canadian geese? I mean, technically, I... yes, but I only bring that up when I'm trying to be funny. It, it doesn't really matter. L- language-wise, most people do say Canadian geese. Okay, okay. But in a very technical <laughs> sense, Canada goose is correct and Canadian goose is incorrect. But nobody knows that and nobody gives a shit. Actually, the monster is not named Frankenstein. <laughs> exactly. Go I, home, on, I only bring it You're up pedantic. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say I'm only I only bring it up when I'm trying to be pedantic. Uh okay, so then we have a bit where Lyra talks about how Pan turns into an ermine and curls up around her neck and helps keep her warm, which generates so many questions in my brain because that means a demon generates its own heat. So we know it's not like a ghost. We know it's an actual physical being that presumably if it has heat, it has blood and its own heartbeat and like its own brain and all that sort of thing. And I'm like, well, can they get sick? Like, I know that if a human gets sick, the demon is also sick, but can a demon be the one to catch the illness? Can a demon get cancer? Can they hold their breath? Well, so that was kind of what worried me because I feel like your lifespan in this world should be really dependent on what form your demon settles in because some demons are going to be way more (laughs) susceptible to like just like accidents and predation than other demons, you know, like, I mean, it's they've talked about people with insect demons, right? Like you your moth is going to get squished or, you know, <laughs> there, I, there are actual animals. Like if you have a chicken demon or like a little bird demon, like it's probably going to get eaten by a cat at some point And then you're just fucked. I do think, I don't know if it's talked about here or in a later story, but I do think animals can tell the difference between a demon and an animal. And animals leave demons that alone. Yes. Yes. They're like weird mystical mojo. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. like same thing with a human. Like they know if they're looking at an animal or a demon. Okay. That makes sense too. Yeah, that made me think like could you transplant an organ from one demon to another and like what what would be the implications of like the metaphysics of that? Like is that like getting married to that person or something <laughs> like you now you're part of each other or is it not even a thing? I, yeah, it's weird. I just wish Pullman hadn't had that. <laughs> Because it would be, I wouldn't, it's going to bother me forever. Yeah, that it keeps her warm. Isn't it, and isn't that just a nice name for a weasel? Um, isn't ermine? that what an, an ermine, ermine is? I think it's pretty much like a winter weasel. Okay. <laughs> but, so Lyra's a weasel. Uh, well, ermine is said to be one of Pan's favorite shapes to take. And do we think that that is indicative of what Pan will settle as? I can't answer this question. I know the answer. It kind of makes sense because they're like 
Trixie and I yeah, I think it fits her personality wise. I want something more noble for her, but like I could understand it. Wait, so does this mean that demons also have like limited stamina in the know. same way that like a human or other animal would run out of energy? Like, I don't know. I think we only do see. Do they get tired? I think we only see like a demon be tired when a human is tired, when their human right. is tired, not any human, obviously. Okay. That happens so, in this part. Yeah. So I, I genuinely don't know if, like, the only people who could really answer that would be a witch, because they can send their demon off, you know, on a sprint. Uh, a regular or a non-witch human couldn't really. They have to stay within certain bounds of each other. I guess they could have their demon do jumping jacks or something. <laughs> I just pictured this That's one of my favorite things, doing jumping actually. Jacks. Like, that whole thing with the witches, I that's a thing that I love in fantasy books. And that was, like, a big thing in, like, the late 80s and through the 90s was, like, all of these, you know, like Pullman is so good about laying down the rules. Uh, we get that whole scene with the badger where basically like Pan is dragging her mm. right when she's she can't be brave. And so he's brave for her. Um, and then we find out that the witches can have their demons go far away. And it doesn't feel like some kind of mistake or oversight or like he's being cheap with the rules. Like when the demon shows up, everyone is astonished. Yeah. Like they can't. Where's the human? I can't believe this. And so that tells you that like there's some like they don't understand everything. And that feels more like science. Like that's a, our relationship, you know, kind of with science where like Newton like describes gravity, but we don't know why gravity. And then Einstein comes along and like says why gravity, you know, because space gets warped and stuff. That feels so having the, the demon show up without the human feels like a kind of scientific like this is like extra physics or something like that. And I love that stuff that always makes the world feel more realistic. That is very good. You have a line here about Beowulf that <laughs> I don't I don't know what that was that in the chapter. No, I just thought about it because of Yorick, um, because he's a, a bear that can talk, right? He's like a person bear. Um, and a lot of linguists and philologists believe that the name Beowulf means like literally a bee, like a bee that buzzes and goes around flowers, and then a wolf. And like a bee wolf is that's like a bear. Let's the bears go after bees because they love honey. And like, so they hunt after bees. Right. Gotcha. And so the name Beowulf is like he's a man who's big as a bear and strong as a bear and he's like a bear person. And so it just made me think of your that he's like a were bear or something. Okay. I thought I had missed something in the book where somebody mentioned Beowulf and no, that he was a no. were bear and I was like, What does this mean? <laughs> I guess I'm just trying to think of like, where did Pullman come up with this and why? Gotcha. Like, why are there bears that can talk in this world? And the only thing I can think of is like Beowulf and like, and that connection. Gotcha. Okay. And since we've spent so long talking about souls and what are souls, blah, blah, blah. Can we at least just spend a couple minutes talking about the armor as a soul thing? Because that, I feel like, doesn't seem like it fits quite with like the rest of the philosophy of the book right i don't I guess, know if you guys have thoughts on it i do i guess i talked about this with alan before we were recording so i genuinely don't think that that's what pullman thinks i think yorick was saying that to lyra to explain how important his armor is to him and that he really has no idea what a demon is i see it's more to show like the bear's lack of understanding what a soul is and how important his armor is to him even if it's because we have a bit later where he talks about how he lost his original armor or it was taken from him or whatever and so he made himself new armor and then uh lyra was immediately like i couldn't make a new pan like that doesn't make sense so mm -hmm. I, I i think it's just like a cultural difference between the, or a miscommunication i see yeah I don't think that's a rule of the world. It's like, yeah, totally. Like he's, he's trying to make an analogy and she's like, your analogy is bad. <laughs> okay. Well, I agree. His analogy is bad. <laughs> it does raise the question though, are, are the bears like, like you and me, do their souls exist inside of them or are they somewhere in between an animal and a human and they don't have souls, but they have minds. 
Yeah, they def I definitely had this feeling through these chapters because of the reactions of the humans to on the one hand to the demon showing up without a human and on the other hand to Tony being without a demon mm -hmm. like their reactions don't feel intuitive to me because we don't live in a world where humanness is to have a demon yeah like their reactions are appropriate for them but I feel alienated by them and weirdly I feel closer to York because of it like I, I feel like oh I get him because like he's normal the way that people are and these people who I have been relating to for the whole book are now kind of alien to me. It's weird that you use the word normal because it's all like appearances. Like what Pullman is saying is that they are just the same as us, except that they can see and therefore discuss with their souls. While if the bears do have the same type of soul as humans, the appearance is that it's inside of them and they can't talk with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more like us, like yeah. you said. So I don't know that it's an interesting thought about whether or not the bears have souls or if they're different in more than just look. Well, I he also... can also like tell the future or something, right? Like he can, he, well, not the future, but like she, that whole thing of her trying to hit him and he's like, you can't trick me. I'm a bear. I don't think that was I'm... seeing the future. I think that was him being like very good at observing the tells and how someone was going to act. The implication is that it's mystical, like in he links it to the alethiometer. He's like, you can read that thing and I can read you the same way. Maybe this is another bad analogy on his part. I was just going to say that. Uh, Yorick doesn't understand how the alethiometer works. Uh, Anya, you were going to say something? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, I was just going to say that I think it's hilarious that Lyra actually says hashtag not all bears in the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag and all. Yeah. <laughs> She's a bear apologist. She is. She's Maybe they'll do that in the show. At the very Hashtag least, she's um, she's a Yorick apologist. Yorick is lovable, though. Oh, like, yeah. I she's... All this shit that I'm saying about him not understanding, I love Yorick. He's fabulous. And I think him not understanding is just because he is a completely different being, like a physically, like in a way that we can't imagine because we don't have, the only people we can talk to are also human beings. So no matter how different they are, there's a sameness about them. So we really can't imagine what it's like to talk to a bear. Yeah. Or or to try I mean, to understand someone who is so different. People can talk to gorillas a little bit. That's a fair point. Weird, That's right? a fair point. I, <laughs> yeah. I, no, but yeah. it is like a super weird experience that I think a lot of people get really obsessed over because it is so so strange to like have a conversation with an intelligence that's so different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's... People have talked about that with like elephants or with whales and stuff like that, too. Not necessarily like being able to understand them, but like some of the biologists who first recorded like all of their songs and all that stuff to say like they are clearly like thinking, feeling creatures and like to be around them. You would feel a little bit less special, but also like more alien, you know? Mm hmm. Like, yeah, you know. I hear that a lot um, for people who study like parrots too mm, and like mm. bird intelligence is just so fundamentally different from mammal intelligence it's like alien on a even completely different level compared to like whales and other apes right but anyway I, sorry i very no, distracted this is all good to <laughs> good to bring up i just wasn't i wasn't thinking of it that way just because we can't have like a full conversation with these creatures you know we can't learn about their culture and vice versa Mm -hmm. or at, le at least yet i don't know other than by they can't mm -hmm. they can't make bad analogies to us yeah exactly <laughs> so anya i can't believe you haven't brought up texas <sighs> you're not supposed to give away <laughs> that i'm from texas alan <laughs> i feel like we've said that before <laughs> have we oh yeah maybe we have do you feel texas. a national pride knowing that it is its own country i mean it was its own country. I mean, I have a complicated relationship with Texas. Like, <laughs> I mean, everything is a racist project. Texas was a racist project. The United States is a racist project. Um, but sure, yeah. I it it is I did find it a little bit funny on some level that in this universe, Texas has remained its own separate nation. 
I I'm baffled by the existence of Texas. Like I, it made me want to know the entire history because, like I said, oh, like, if you had grown up in Texas, you would know the entire history because you would have been forced to take Texas history in school over and over again. Yeah, but the English came over here because they were Puritans as part of the Protestant Reformation, which didn't happen in this world. So, like, oh, wow. I see what you mean. That kind There's of no like, America. how did Texas exist? Like, yeah, how did any of that happen? Like, I, it's not that I don't think that it couldn't happen. I'm just very interested in how it happened. That is interesting. Well, wasn't? Oh God, no! I don't want to talk about. I know nothing about American history, like literally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't that? I don't know much. Oh about no, it. this is great! Now I'm actually going to be able to correct you when you I, no, <laughs> come well, up with I a was wild thinking, half theory. I don't really know much about European history either, and this would be like. <sighs> can we talk about Canada for once? No. Um, <laughs> then actually, you'd find out how much I don't know about Canadian history. <laughs> but um, I feel like wasn't sort of like Mexico and the sort of parts of America that are just above it, not so much, uh, what is the word, colonized by the English, but more by the Spanish? Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so isn't That's it why everything possible has that... like Spanish place names yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. a lot of Hispanic people that have been living in those areas since before the border crossed them. Right, of course. And so then wouldn't, I feel like the Spanish people didn't come over because of, you know, Puritans trying to escape England or uh, Puritans trying to escape Protestants or whatever it was. They, they were they came over. They came over for like resources. They wanted gold and yes. bullshit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's probably mm-hmm. why Texas is a country. They still came over for the gold. And they then still did their Spanish. mission projects. Yes, then he should speak Spanish. Good point. But this book was written by an Englishman. No, it's cool. Like, I don't, I'm not mad about it. I'm, I'm curious. Like, I want like a whole in-universe history book mm-hmm. that like explains the, you know, the extra continents that they discovered. or like Maybe how Texas is down. somewhere else. Maybe I Texas need... is like the Azores. Cool. That's cool. I like that. <laughs> and they definitely except sorry. except that like the english word texas is a bastardization of a spanish word that's a bastardization oh, right. of a native word but Shit. maybe pullman didn't know that probably not because it's cool to have this american out of nowhere right just show up and uh, be he's like, a texan you're right you're right america you're right. doesn't appear to exist as a country no i think yeah you're totally right it's it's great that he shows up and he's got like this whole different energy from everyone else. And mm-hmm. you're just like, oh, this is fascinating. So I don't know. Like he was like, I mean, oh, Texas. in the TV show, uh, Lee Scoresby is played by a Latino. So, yeah, that's which true. Is great. And actually, if you maybe speak Spanish, it will be great. I was going to say maybe they don't go into it in the book, but it's very possible that Lee does speak Spanish. He just doesn't in the book because he's in England. True. And they wouldn't know what he was saying anyway. Yeah. So why do that? Oh, that's that's my new headcanon. I love that. <laughs> For a show that we haven't even watched yet. Well, I mean, you can headcanon it in the book because it, it yeah. never comes up. The Spanish. That's speaking. fair. In fact, I think it makes a lot of sense considering. I'm so glad I didn't like insult the history of um Europe and Texas and Spain. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> I'm pretty sure like everything about like. Mexico, Texas area history, I learned from watching Zorro. So perfect. <laughs> I'm sure it's all wrong. I think that's all California anyway. It's like how everything I know about American history I got from Hamilton and National Treasure. So <laughs> perfect, also. Yeah. I'm sure I understand your country and culture very well. Yeah, I think it hits the high notes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, you guys know the Six Flags theme park? In yeah. theory. Yeah, so the Six Flags are the Six Flags over Texas. They are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, because you grew up in Louisiana. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they are Mexico, Spain, France, uh, shit, Texas, the Confederacy, and the United States. 
And so the original Six Flags theme park has like sections for each of those areas, including like a very uh, not good Old South section. Nice. Yeah. Hey, man. That's Hashtag, like. Hashtag uh, Splash Mountain. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> wrong park but yes no that's same like, idea i mean that's like my favorite texas fact to throw on people from other parts of the country <laughs> who are just like blows their mind if there's one other thing to say i was honestly like a little bit annoyed at the way that farter Corum initially describes seraphina before it was super clear that he was actually in a relationship with her because right. <laughs> he was like totally objectifying her and then it's like, okay, well, that is kind of just like the way that dudes talk about ladies who they've slept with. So whatever. <laughs> like 40 years ago, he was like bragging about, I think she would remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll see when she shows up how we, how yeah. we, what we think about that relationship. I'm not saying anything. That's it for this week. Join us next time. We'll be talking about chapters 14 through 17. If you like the show, take some time to give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Anya, and you can follow me on Twitter at Strangely Literal. That's Strangely, then L-I-T-E-R-L. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. You can follow the show on Twitter at M-O-T-Pod. Need more than 280 characters to speak your mind? Send your email to contact at hollowedgroundmedia.com. And remember to not let the humans trick you out of your armor. Not my best work, but oh well. <laughs>